This is a proof that Kepler's second law is equivalent to the conservation of angular momentum. So first of all, what is Kepler's second law? Well, that's the one that says if you have a planet orbiting around the sun, so this big M here is the sun and our planet is over here, uh, that the line connecting the sun and the planet sweeps out equal areas and equal times. So if I call that area A, then what this is really saying is that dA dt, that's the rate the uh, area is being swept out, must be a constant. So that's the uh, Kepler's second law part. What about the conservation of angular momentum? Well, that says that L, angular momentum, that's a constant. And we're talking about the uh, angular momentum of our planet here as it's orbiting around the sun. And if uh, these two are equivalent, then they should be saying the same thing. And that's what I want to prove. So let's start by looking at a little bit of area here that's been swept out. And so if we're going to imagine a teeny tiny little bit of area, we're going to have it's swept out by a really teeny tiny little angle. So I'll call this delta theta. This is a really small theta here, where this angle here, that's our big theta. And this middle line right here, that's going to be r, and so we're sweeping out a little bit around r, very, 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 very tiny angle. And that's going to uh, travel, the planet's going to travel on a little tiny path during that time. And I'll call that little tiny path delta s. And the uh, goal here is to get an expression for the area that's being swept out. So that would be the area of this shape right in here. That's what we're trying to find. Uh, so that little tiny area of this uh, shape here, I'm going to call that delta a. OK, so we got to get an expression for delta a. Well, this kind of. Uh, looks like a little sector of a circle almost. And you know for a circle that if I have a radius r and I have a sector with an angle theta, that this arc length here, s, is related to r and theta by s equals r theta. And I can kind of say the same thing here because if theta's, delta theta is really, 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 really small, then we can imagine that this delta s would sweep out something that looks like r delta theta. So I'm going to say that if theta is really, really small, then delta s is about equal to r delta theta. And now I have an expression that uh, will help me to get the area, because this area here looks kind of like a triangle. I mean, I'm greatly exaggerating this ellipse here. Remember that for the planet traveling around the sun, it's almost a circular orbit. It's uh, only a little bit elliptical. But even still, if delta theta is really, really small, then you can imagine that this area would be very, very close to what would look like a triangle. So in that case, I can say that delta A, my area, well, area is 1 half base times height. So that would be 1 half times the base. Well, the base in this case is delta S. That's my base, and then the height would be r. That's this r right here. So if you can imagine that, little tiny little triangle here with a very, 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 very tiny delta theta. OK, so uh, delta s, that's r delta theta. So I can say now then that the area is approximately equal to 1 half times r delta theta times r. And that is just 1 half times delta theta times r squared. OK, so far so good. Now, I'm interested not in uh, the change in the area, but I want the change in area over the change in time. So delta a over delta t is what I'm really interested in. And so delta a over delta t, in this case, is going to be this expression with a delta t, and I put an equals here, I should probably make this a almost equal to. 
Uh, so that'll be a one half r squared, and then I have delta theta over delta t. And if I want to get dA over dt, what I can do is I can take the limit as delta t goes to zero of this thing, of delta A over delta t. And then that will give me dA dt. And if I let that happen, then this will be one half r squared d theta dt. But what's d theta dt? Well, d theta dt, that's just omega. So if I want, I can say that dA dt is equal to one half r squared omega. And so that's the first half of this proof here. It's a uh, important relation here. Now I gotta get angular momentum involved. Okay, so to get angular momentum involved, uh, I need to calculate the angular momentum for my little planet right here. And to do that, I need to use the formula for angular momentum. So the magnitude of angular momentum is going to be r times p times the sine of phi. So what are all these things? r, okay, that's this distance right here, that's r. P, that's the linear momentum. And phi, that's the angle between this position vector r and the linear momentum when they're placed so their tails coincide. So let's uh, label all these things on the diagram here. So first, I have my linear momentum. So that's uh, tangent to the path here because linear momentum is mv and the velocity is tangent to the path. And I can decompose this into a component that points along r here and then another component that's perpendicular to that. So the magnitudes of these would be pr and then p perpendicular. Okay, so uh, I want to try and write the angular momentum in terms of these things here. So well, I have uh, my r vector is going to go from the sun to the planet, and I have my linear momentum vector, so I need to figure out this angle phi. That's going to be the tricky part. So here's the horizontal line, and imagine that I take my linear momentum vector, this p vector right here, pick it up, and I move it and put it down right there. I didn't change the orientation. I didn't change the length. Just picked it up and moved it down there. And I can do the same thing with the perpendicular vector right here. Just picked it up, moved it down there. Didn't change the orientation, didn't change the length. And then I have r right here. So that would be the vector pointing from the sun to the planet. And I picked it up and moved it over here. Uh, I did change the length just so I could fit it on the diagram, but you know, in reality, I, I wouldn't have changed the length. I just made it a little shorter so it looks uh, like it can fit here nicer without going off the page. And the angle that I want, well, I want the angle between the p vector and the r vector. So I want this angle right here. That's what I'm trying to find, that's phi. This angle right here, that's theta. That's this vector r makes with the horizontal, that's theta. And the perpendicular vector p and r, that's at a 90 degree angle. This is a 90 degree angle right here, perpendicular to each other. That's why it's called perpendicular. So let me write 90 degrees. Okay. So that means that the vector uh, or the angle phi here is this whole thing. And this thing right here, that angle, well, that must be uh, phi minus 90 degrees. That's what's left over right there, right? So let's write that here. That's phi minus 90 degrees. Okay, so far so good. And so now I need to figure out how to relate that to the sine of phi. Hmm, okay, well, let's see what we can do here. If I uh, were to make a triangle right here, make this 90 degree angle right there, then I can say that the um, cosine of phi minus 90 degrees
Well, by Sokotoa, cosine would be adjacent, that would be P perpendicular, over the hypotenuse, which is just regular P. Okay, so that tells me that P perpendicular is P times the cosine of phi minus 90 degrees. Aha, we're almost there because the cosine of phi minus 90 degrees, that is sine of phi. So I'll write that up here. So this tells me that P perpendicular is P times the sine of phi because cosine of phi minus 90 is the sine of phi. Great, so now I can go back up here. So what is L? Well, P times the sine of phi, that's P perpendicular. So this is R P perpendicular. Great, now what? Uh, well, R times P perpendicular, that must be R times M times V perpendicular because linear momentum is MV. So if it's P perpendicular, this is M V perpendicular. But what's V perpendicular? Well, V perpendicular, if you remember, that's just the uh, omega times r. So think about that for a second here. So V perpendicular. Well, if you think about for a circle, you know that if an object is rotating around this way and here's the object, that the velocity vector is tangent to the path, that's my V, and that is perpendicular to what would be r here, the radius. So the same thing applies here. V perpendicular is omega times r. Uh, same relationship that you would have with a circle. And this is great because this ends up looking very close to uh, what we have up here for dA dt. We have now m and then we have r squared omega. And if you look, we have an r squared omega in this expression as well. So if we combine these two things, I can say that dA dt is the same thing as L over 2M. Okay, and that's the big result here. So what does that tell us? Well, if we know uh, that Kepler's second law is true, then that says that the area swept out over a certain amount of time is a constant, and if this side of the equation is a constant, this side must be a constant. Well, M certainly isn't changing, so that means L must also be a constant. And it works the other way around, too. If I know that L is constant, that tells me that dA dt is constant. So this proves that Kepler's second law is equivalent to the conservation of angular momentum.